As you travel through the furthest reaches of the galaxy, you pick up a distant transmission. Signal received. Decrypting message. Welcome to Starchives, presented by Starforce Collective, a crew of spacefaring illustrators on a mission to record nerdy shit for the hope of future generations. Hello and welcome back to Starchives, your cosmic library of everything geeky and nerdy. As always, I am Commander Alex. On my right today is Hunad Taj. How's it, how's it going, Hunad? What's going on, man? How are you? I'm good, man. Saw a couple movies this week, which we're going to talk about later. But we also have another guest. Uh, Jen's back. What's going on, Jen? Not much, dude. So, we're talking about X-Men Apocalypse for a couple minutes. Because it, it, <laughs> it's, it's one of those movies that um, didn't leave a huge impact on me. I liked it. I, I didn't I didn't hate it like I did with a previous uh, superhero movie, which we will not mention. But um, uh, I don't think you saw it, Jen, right? No, no it's so. just me and Hunad. So we'll we'll uh, we'll wax for about five minutes on this. Um, Hunad, what did you think of X Men Apocalypse? Uh, it was okay. <laughs> That's my default answer to pretty much all movies I've only really seen once because right. I like, haven't had a chance to really absorb it. Um, Aesthetically, it was great. Like uh, a little bit same even with a lot of like the original X Men stuff, but um, you know some of the fan favorite characters are back. You're not just seeing Ellen Page or uh, Patrick Stewart again. You're seeing some new faces this time as well with the newer, younger crew. And that's true. And um, I posted a, a brief review after I saw it on Facebook just to get my initial reaction out. And um, I, I think I still stand with it where the franchise looks like it's going in a good place um, because they're not bringing Brian Singer back to direct, which I know some people thought was a negative, but I think is a positive that he's not returning. I don't find him to be particularly... Does Brian Singer, which ones did he do? He did the first two. He did X-Men 1 and 2. Oh, okay. Um, and that's kind of why people... You know, are, 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 are touting him as <laughs> oh. a great director because it's like, oh yeah, they're the originals and X2 is the best one. And I'm like, yeah, it's the best one of a mediocre film series. Like, mm. you know, you can't you can't call him the best one when the other guy who did X-Men 3 was Brett Ratner. Like, that's not that's not a point of reference. Brett Ratner. Well, didn't Brian Singer go off to do Superman Returns? I believe he did. Yeah, um, and that, that was and not... And that, that was a stinker, too. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean to be fair, we haven't really had a good Superman movie since the 70s, so... Um, People just seem... They keep being very, um, almost like, wanting to be metaphor-heavy on Superman, which is like, I feel like it's the wrong approach to it. He's Jesus. Like, well, it's just like, Superman has this... I mean, I think there's kind of two ways you can approach it, which isn't really has been approached by anybody right now because everybody wants to do it's like what if we made him so gritty and it's like eh. you know you can't have two batmans in a batman versus superman movie but anyway it's like basically yeah. if you want to do a superman movie you either have to have him be like a really good dude who believes in the morals of the world and protecting it mm -hmm. or you could have you could go the super dickery route where he's, <laughs> he's just a really big asshole to love his lane all the time i want i want to see <laughs> i want to see a movie now called super dickery <laughs> Because uh, there's definitely starring um, starring <laughs> Seth Rogen as Superman no. and Jonah Hill as Batman. <laughs> oh my god, that sounds terrible. <laughs> Michael Sarah as Green Lantern. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's actually funny that you mentioned <laughs> that you mentioned the kind of morality of Superman, and I, uh, ironically, I've seen the best way to do Superman, and I've seen it recently, and that it's through a show called The Flash. Like in that show, what the, is this show? The Flash. The Flash is about <laughs> the Flash, <laughs> and it's really good because, like, Barry Allen is a really good person, mm -hmm. like, and he's very optimistic and positive, despite you know his mom is murdered when he's very young. That's not a spoiler; everyone knows. Batman, it, 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 get over it, Batman. Basically, <laughs> like, like Batman never forgives and he never forgets, but Barry Allen. Like, he tries to see the good in people despite mm -hmm. that, and 
you know, he still wants, he wants justice for his mother. Like, he wants to find out who did it. Yeah. But he's not going to kill him or, you know, try, mm -hmm. try to get vengeance is, is the key. Um, and through, through the entire show, like, you know, you, you see Barry try to save as many people as he can. There's, mm -hmm. there, there's even a, an episode where um, all of the metahumans that they've rounded up through the course of the first season, mm -hmm. there's a chance that they may die in an event. Okay. So Barry, the, most of the episode is about him trying to find a way to move them into a different location to mm -hmm. keep them safe. And it's like any other hero would be like, ah, fuck him. Just, uh, just let him die, because yeah. they're, they're evil, but that's not who he is. And that's kind of what we're missing with Superman, is that well, again, the Flash you just, saves people, and he helps them. You just have this thing of, um, I mean, really, he is a all-powerful being. He technically has the power to be omnipotent, because he has, like, supersonic hearing and all that shit. Um, so... I feel like he, with Superman, a, you yeah. more have to be like, if you have somebody who is all powerful, what is the situation that you can put them in to make them vulnerable? Exactly. And I guess the answer is kind of making them fight Batman, I guess. Not really, though, because that's kind of like. It was super um, contrived. Well, because it's like with Dark Knight, you had the whole concept of uh, what happens when an immovable. Uh, an unstoppable object. force meets an immovable object, yes. Um, which I thought, like, that worked really well within the yeah. context of him versus Joker, but. They were both human. So even yes. though they, you know, the Joker was like this maniacal mastermind, they were still kind of, they could be on an equal footing to make it an interesting like conflict. Yeah. But with like, it's not really the same because like, Super like Superman is, I know that it's like, and Alex will probably be like, but when you actually think power to power and because everybody in this fucking like Marvel and DC universe is like a super genius. Like that yeah. is like a pre <laughs> super like, smart, super rich, that's super everybody. good looking. Exactly, that's everybody. Because it's like if it was just some people were like, some of them had powers, and then some people didn't have powers, but they're really smart. But it's like the people with powers are really smart too. So yeah. you can't really be like, well, Batman has a superior intellect. Because it's like, okay, but Superman is invincible. So <laughs> yeah, and I mean, unless you have a kryptonite spear. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to say for a brief second, because I, clearly I haven't complained about Batman v Superman <laughs> enough. But the the way that they um, the way that they kind of defeat Superman. So the way you should have defeated Superman in that movie is not with a fucking spear made out of all the kryptonite that you have. I mean, they could have just gone the like kryptonite crucifix. I mean, <laughs> oh, nice. The, I but mean, he's it, not the devil or a vampire. No, but no, like they, 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 they were going oh, for <laughs> crucify him. They yeah. were definitely going for the spear that stabbed Christ, like on the cross. And yeah. I'm like, wow, you're uh, you're really on the nose there, Zack Schneider. But you know, like everyone was expecting, my, myself included, that like Batman would just make kryptonite lined gauntlets, because then at least you have. You, like you, you don't have a limited amount of uh, uses with because um, he makes uh, grenades with powdered kryptonite in them that yeah they they explode in Superman's face and he's weakened for a few minutes but then the effects dissipate because obviously it, the particles mm -hmm. go off into the air and I'm just like he only has to be in proximity to kryptonite to get weakened so yeah. why wouldn't you just line your suit with it Mm -hmm. Which is what he does in the comic books. He makes a kryptonite suit. Or uh, even in some of the animated movies, he's got a kryptonite bullet. Yeah. Or like a ring or something. And or just a chunk of it. And in most yeah. the animated series or Batman Beyond, he just has like just carry a one chunk. In his belt. Well, yeah. always has a chunk of kryptonite. Why not? <laughs> even, in, even in the most recent uh, Justice League versus Teen Titans, mm -hmm. they have to fight Superman. So Damian Wayne, aka the current Robin has a chunk of kryptonite he gets from the Batcave and stabs Superman with it to weaken him um, while he's possessed by Tri Trigon. Um, anyway, the, it's not that complicated, guys. Like, <laughs> Well, again, and I feel like that's kind of the thing with superhero movies right now is that um, the questions that they are engaging their characters with are maybe not the questions that need to be driving conflict. Because, again, it's like, 
you know, putting in the, I mean, uh, historically in the comic, the reason that there even is kryptonite to stop Superman is because uh, the guys who were doing the radio play originally uh, had to take a week off. So they needed something to uh, weaken Superman so that they could take a break from the show. Oh, I didn't know that. That's cool. Um, so, I mean, when they originally started it, it's like he wasn't really... Um, they, he was just supposed to be invincible. That was the concept of him. So it's just like that whole idea of being like, oh, well, what kind of kryptonite item can we fight him with? It's like, that's, that's boring. That doesn't yeah. matter. It's more the question it's, it's of... It's not a creative solution. Like a more interesting question is looking at things of... Maybe not how are these supernatural beings fighting other supernatural beings, yeah. but how does it relate to them on a personal level and interacting with normal people or in normal like, situations? Why are they fighting them? Um, but they do all these stories, like they do narratives that are based on them, but they tend to not be the blockbuster narratives that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, production companies and directors and investors want to put their money into because they don't feel that that will sell. Um, it's the only reason why you get Transformers and. Well, and to be honest, when I think of um, interesting kind of angles to take the stories from, because for example, um, I really like the idea for Batman, the one kind of AU where um, Bruce died, and it's yeah. his parents that Flashpoint. become, uh, yeah, where his parents become the Joker and Batman. They're, they're doing Flashpoint. Are they? Yeah, That's on cool. the Flash. Um, well, they're, they're, they're going to be doing something <laughs> similar to it, right. um, I believe. But I just mean from the point of view of doing something, uh, and I know that, that that's not a new idea that was, you know, um, but just from the point of view of taking it from a different angle, that's like, that's an interesting thing of being like, what if this was what it was? Mm -hmm. um, for Superman, I think that kind of interesting angle was, um, and he, I'm sure you know the name of this one, where he falls into Soviet Russia. Uh, he's very Red, Red Sun. Sun. Yeah. Yeah. There's another um, one, actually. Um, Bruce Tim was involved in a series. Mm -hmm. like, it's a film called uh, Justice League Gods and Monsters, okay. mm -hmm. where uh, Superman Carlyle is not actually uh, Jor El's son. Yeah. It's Zod's DNA that is mixed in with his mother. So he's actually Zod's son, what he oh, calls. Yeah, like the, his family is a Mexican migrant work family instead. Okay. So it sort of flips the role and it, they, they go over the fact that, you know, whether it's his nature to be good yeah. or evil, and whether his upbringing and his the like the the influences of his parents and nature their nature versus, versus yeah. nurture exactly, and the, you know they sort of changed up like Batman's actually a vampire, like and it's not it's not Bruce Wayne, it's <laughs> a, some dude named Kurt. Um, <laughs> Kurt. I don't remember, I don't remember the names of the characters. Um, I'm Kurt the vampire. Um. It's it's actually pretty funny. It's a good movie too, and like Wonder Woman is. Of one of the granddaughters of the um, All Father, or the, oh, okay. from uh, okay. Genesis, New Genesis. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so they they've changed all the characters up, but you know they're still the Justice League or yeah. three of the the founding characters. Right. Well, and I just feel like both of them. I mean, in the way, I guess you could kind of say this about Avengers, but I feel like a lot more so for the Justice League is that it was really created as the idea of selling like the American dream in its different facets and exploring that. Um, and right now is a very disillusioned time to be selling that idea. Yeah. So that's, I think that's why we got a movie like Batman well, versus I, Superman, because I, how do you yeah. sell that to the people who are watching it today? Because, they don't want it. And you're right, because even, even in the Marvel universe, like we, they have their own version of that. It's called Civil War. <laughs> okay um like civil war yeah. and i mean you've always had it with x-men like x-men yeah. has never really been light and mm -hmm. uh, except in obviously the show i'm talking more about the movies yeah. they've always had this weird serious tone that is yeah. mixed together with really kind of sh shitty and cheesy action like it, yeah. it's very schlocky but they they play it completely straight well, and going back to the X-Men movies, yeah. um, I feel like, because uh, how old were we when um, the, like, the first... The first one came out in 99 or 2000, so we would have so been around, we were pretty young. around 9 or 10, pre-teen age. Um, and that was a movie that, like, I mean... Kunad like, was, like, 30. <laughs> yeah. Eternal, that's what you want about. Um, <laughs> Exist only in darkness. That's a poll from episode two, guys. Go back and watch that. Um, Good times. But it was definitely one where... It was to be, okay, 
I suppose disclaimer, I am not a big fan of the original X-Men movies. Um, They're, they, they, are they haven't a, aged well at all. They are a little bit of a time capsule. Yeah. To early 2000s fantasy sci-fi movies, which had a very definitive style that was maybe not very good. Um, because again, this was before Lord of the Rings came out. Yeah. Before, you know, it was really the was also first big superhero movie that they'd done in that time period. It was also before, um, as, or Spider around the same time, Spider-Man came out. Because Spider-Man came out right after 9-11. Like, the first Spider-Man. Oh. Which was, <laughs> a, well, I mean, it, it was a thing because the first poster featured the two yeah, towers. Yeah, and they had to have changed And they had to alter that out um but it also like in, in that case right we we're, were following the trend of sort of campy uh superhero movies like batman forever and batman and robin mm -hmm. where for they, better for worse yeah. for better for yeah. worse right where the first spider-man was very much like that like mm -hmm. green was wearing like a power suit yeah, yeah. kind of like you know he didn't have go goblin nipples but <laughs> thank goodness <laughs> but it was close enough yeah but but what makes that movie work mm -hmm. as opposed to like and, and why you can you can go back and watch the Tobey Toby Maguire Spider Man movies, <laughs> even three, which I don't like. There's the best one. But I know it's your favorite. But, <laughs> but I mean, even for me, there's parts of three that do work. Like there's there's stuff that shines through, um, but especially with the first two, yeah. two in particular. Those movies are anchored by really rock solid villain performances. Mm -hmm. Like you look at Willem Dafoe mm -hmm. and uh, Alfred. Well, even the uh, James Franco in the older ones. Yeah, uh, like he he's was actually so good. really he's solid. Good. Yeah. Considering that now, like if it was like, sorry, James Franco, I just feel like <laughs> he's if kind of weird now. Yeah, I don't know. Like don't it's know. just like kind of he's grown into a weird sort of relationship with viewers. Like, I feel like nowadays if it was like he's going to be like a villain in like a superhero movie, you'd kind of be like, okay. Because I, I mean, I just think of like Spring Breakers. Oh, yeah. Um, which, I mean, he was like a good villain in that. I'll give him that. It's just he plays like a very certain character. And I guess I'm still mad at him because of this stupid Oz movie. Oh. And I will not forgive that Ugh. movie. I, I started watching that. I lost interest. I saw it in theaters. and Oh, I regret, wow. I regret spending Why? Money. Why would you do that to yourself? I really like Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I really like the series, and I was very hopeful because it's another... I know you're a huge Wicked fan, too. It's another Sam Raimi movie. And right, they, that's true. They basically Alice in Wonderland... Well, Tim uh, Burton, Alice in uh, Wonderland it. Where they're speaking like... Speaking of that, sorry, there's a second one that just came out. Oh, I have opinions about that, too. Did you see it? No. I it's, worked on uh, it. It's, oh, no. Oh god! Oh, well, I thought I, you I, said I worked on it. I'm like, not how could you? You, you did some <laughs> well, did, 3D, right? Yeah, I, no, I did actually. I only did compositing, like uh, clean plates and stuff for yeah. the 3D department, but for the new Alice in Wonderland. Look through the looking glass, yeah, man. Well, I'll try and be brief. Uh, I'm also quite a large Alice in Wonderland fan of the books, uh, but I prefer through the looking glass because uh, it's more structured to a concept than right. Wonderland. Rather than a weird shroom trip. And it's just like with, um, the thing is is that the original Alice in Wonderland cartoon by Disney uh, incorporated parts of the both stories. Right. Because they were like, how can we, um, like back then you didn't do sequels. They were like, we're just going to do this one off. Yeah. Um, also, apparently it was a really big pet project of Walt Disney that lasted about 20 years before it actually came to culmination. And mm. by the time it finished, he completely hated it. It Ugh. was a box. A blockbuster failure that almost bankrupted Disney if uh, Cinderella hadn't come out a few years earlier. Wow. Um, also, fun fact, apparently uh, Aldous Huxley wrote the script for Alice in Wonderland. And then when Walt Disney read it, reminder, this is the author who wrote Brave New World. Um, so, kind of a dark dude. Uh, he was like, this is too dark for a children's movie. It's like, why did you hire Aldous Huxley to write your script for him? <laughs> um, but needless to say, so that cartoon was like, I feel like um, it blended the elements of the stories, like, it worked. Um, it wasn't really offensive, I thought it was good as a story. But, like, with the Tim Burton one, it's like, they already pulled elements from Through the Looking Glass. Like, there's no White Queen in Wonderland. It's basically... I mean, it's not even Wonderland anyways, because they're like, oh, she's traveling back to this place she's already been. So it's already, like, a flash, like, a continuation story. And so to go back now and be like, oh, we're doing a sequel, it's Through the Looking Glass, it's like... The first one you did was in Wonderland, so... I can't even remember if I saw, like, the Tim Burton Alice in Wonderland. Do or... you remember Johnny Depp doing a really fucked up animated dance at the end? After she fights the Jabberwocky? 
And it's the worst thing ever. Maybe I just watched the Nostalgia Critic for it. Yeah, that's the one I watched. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want to see this movie. Because, like, I feel like I saw the movie by watching that review, and um, I, I, I don't know if I need to actually go out I would and, not recommend. and see it. I'm, just, I'm not a fan of, like, the Tim Burton aesthetic, like, in his films. Like, I'm not a huge fan of, like, the Tim Burton Batman. Like... Nope. It's, it's, it's weird, too, because uh, you'll find a lot of people um, tout the Tim Burton Batman as being, like, super like revolutionary and good and stuff and i suppose yeah. at the time it was like the 89 batman was unlike anything really uh, ever made before is that the one with uh, michelle pfeiffer batman? yeah that's that's Sorry, Catwoman. that's the second one that's yeah. batman returns still made yeah. by tim burton okay. though okay um the first one features jack nicholson as the yes. joker yes okay mm. but See, it's I also feel like he at least did something interesting with it yeah. Uh, um, like, even for the time period, he at least was kind of innovative. But... And, to be fair, it set us up later in 2004, if I'm getting my dates correct, 2004 or 5, for uh, Christopher Nolan to do Batman Begins, which is my favorite Batman movie of all time. Um, maybe other than Mask <laughs> of the Phantasm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Trevor uh, Returns. Which, as we've already discussed what? before... I don't. I like Batman Beyond better than the Bruce Wayne Batman. I like Terry Megan is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I like Batman we, Beyond when I was younger. We, we might get that eventually. I, I hope not now. Like I, I hope far in the future, where Zack Schneider is no longer a movie director, <laughs> we will actually have someone so, who. Is it actually confirmed that they've passed the helm to Ben Affleck to do the other movies? Um, because I know that they were saying that. I don't know about Justice League. Um, I just mean like as a for the solo Batman movie that they're doing. It is Ben Affleck is directing it and he's also writing it. And starring it. And starring it. <laughs> Which is great because all of the movies that he has done all of those three things in yeah. have been awesome. Like the the ones that I've seen are The Town, Argo, and uh, I mean he was in Gone Girl. He didn't write or direct that. Yeah. It was David Fincher, I believe. But yeah, okay. The Town and um, Argo are both exceptional movies and mm -hmm. they're really well made. And The Town especially kind of felt like a bit of a Batman movie um, with, without what was Batman the town, like, about? the town uh, starred Ben Affleck and Jeremy Renner as brothers in Boston and they were part of like a they, they were like a, a small crime family that would rob banks um, actually the the scene at the beginning where they rob a bank they wear like these weird Halloween masks it reminds me a lot of the opening scene Dark to Night. Dark Knight so I'm like, already you have a solid Batman movie here with Ben Affleck and evil Batman, with it, evil Batman. Brother. And I mean, the, be <laughs> the best part of Batman v Superman was Ben Affleck's Batman. Like everything else was kind of crap. Well, I just feel like with DC is like, I mean, first of all, they should put way more money into their animation department because that's where their good material is. Yeah, just the overall direction of their animated stuff. Um, because I feel like they're really good at kind of, like you're saying, the Mask of uh, the Phantasm? Mask of the Phantasm, yeah. yeah. Um, like, that's just like one-off. There was no, it's going to be a sequel, it's going to be a series. It's going to mm -hmm. be, like, they just told her, like, this is, like, the one little story we're going to do. And we're going to do a really good job with it. As opposed to, like... Also, not to mention, they invented that character for the movie. Mm -hmm. Like, it was never in the show beforehand, mm -hmm. so it was completely new. The, the plot twist, which I won't ruin here, is earned and really cool mm -hmm. and it's it also informs you about like bruce wayne it's like you know it adds it adds depth to the character and mm -hmm. stuff it's it's i highly recommend mask of the phantasm it's it doesn't happen as often anymore because why why create original content or try to create original content when there's so much source material mm -hmm. and the nerds and the fans are going to complain about it anyways regardless of whether it's original content or not it's true well I think it has to also do with like fitting into a kind of genre mold right now um, because that's just something with the animated stuff is that I guess you could kind of argue that like Young Justice and stuff like that kind of fits into that niche of storytelling that everybody's doing right now but I feel like it doesn't because a lot of their animated shows and movies are more about the characters like relationships yeah. and emotional developments and stuff like that as opposed to like we're going to have a big fight like yeah um, all, all of the big battle stuff is kind of in the background yeah. with uh young um, justice and shows like that as opposed to it being the reverse and i feel like it's yeah. even this way with a lot of the marvel movies and stuff now um like there isn't the focus isn't on like i if i want to see like people blow stuff up i can just like 
is all blowing stuff up. I don't, yeah. you know, that's I, not a story. I, um, I mean, like, uh, well, we we talked at length about Civil War, but there's there's a lot of good character stuff in that movie. I mean, obviously you get the bombast and the explodey stuff. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is a good place to kind of circle back to X Men Apocalypse because mm -hmm. where people might get turned off, general audiences might get turned off about this movie is that the action isn't too strong, um, okay. with the exception of a really good Weapon X scene. Um, no, no, <laughs> you, you didn't like it. That was so dumb. You, oh Sorry, man, see, like a, see, I really liked it. Kind of thing, or? Uh, no, it's um, it was it was definitely shoehorned in, but I still uh, there's a there's a nerd in me that that really liked it. Um, but you, but the thing is, like, this is a biased thing because you like Wolverine. Yes. And you, and <laughs> any chance you get Wolverine, you're sort of I'm, like, I'm happy, happy about yes. it. <laughs> but it was like it was really, Didn't it was lame. It. Like it was Aww. so lame. Aww. Well, it sounds like we have mixed opinions on whatever this Wolverine. Is. Okay, well, we'll, we'll set Don't it up then. Don't spoil it. Is it like important to the plot? No. no. Oh, okay. <laughs> then never mind. Sorry, and, I, I didn't know. And if, if was, you like... know anything about Wolverine, you know what it is anyway. Um, They've already gone over this content in like three films. Well, yeah, in X Men Two, they literally well they they do it literally in X Men Origins, where he gets his adamantium claws. Yeah. And then they revisit. Well, they did it first in X Men Two, mm -hmm. where they go back to the. Um, well, they, they give him his the like, memories back or stuff, right? Yeah. Whatever. Basically, they they just use it as an excuse to put Hugh Jackman in the movie and have him rip people's shit apart. The reason, <laughs> now I I will agree that it's, it is a dumb scene. God is giving you a very judging face right now. He's like, okay, Alex, I, justify but I'm, it to me. But I'm, I'm not justifying <laughs> that it's in the movie because there's no reason for it to be there. And it's a two and a half hour movie. They could have cut it easily. Yeah. What I enjoyed about it, despite it being completely con contextless, is that I finally got a scene where Wolverine actually makes people bleed with his claws. And I've been waiting for that for a it's long time. Since 1999. Well, it, it's just one of those things where I was like, that was cool. I could have taken that as like a YouTube clip, but whatever, fine. It's implied that he makes people bleed with his claws. Yeah. You see a lot of like him lunging at the camera and, cuts. and splatters on the wall. Yeah. You don't actually see it's anything. Still Is PG it like a PG-13. Yeah. It's a PG-13 film, I think. So. Um, like I, I haven't seen the R-rated cut of The Wolverine, which is a which is a movie I really like. Um, for the most part, I like about sixty-six percent of it. The the third <laughs> act just ruins uh, it. They okay, should've... I was like, what is the 66? Well, well, because three acts. Where right? the movie should have ended oh, is okay. after this really awesome one on one fight uh, in a like a Japanese mm -hmm. residence where it's it's really it's filmed really interestingly with a lot of silhouettes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And Wolverine has just gotten his healing factor back, so he's back at full power again, mm -hmm. and he fights a samurai. And it's a really cool, like, really tense kind of like, like, yeah, you got him. And then the movie keeps going for um, about 20, 25 more minutes. Just trying to ride that enthusiasm. Turns into, <laughs> turns into dumb schlock after that, so, eh, whatever. Um, but, yeah, uh, I will definitely concede that the Wolverine scene in Apocalypse is A, unneeded, and B, kind of dumb. But I would be lying if I said I didn't like it because I am a Wolverine fan. You can so. be happy. I'm not saying you can't be happy that he wasn't included in the movie, but as far as the context of the film goes... There's it, zero context it, for it him. It did not either. improve the and story. No, exactly. no. Well, it didn't add anything to it because they literally he go there. They, they go to that area and then they leave and there's no impact on anything. Well, there, not in the grand scheme of things. Like it's, I mean, they what? They get the flight suits? No, well, he's a foil, right? Like, he causes chaos in the compound, and that makes it easier for the the teenage X Men to save the middle aged X Men. Yeah, I know, but why did they get captured in the first place? To go there to see Wolverine yeah. break them out. It's <laughs> it's a bit of a loop, right? Yeah. They because as it always does, X Men X Mansion gets blown up again, um, and. That's where you get, like, because you, you've seen Days of Future Past, there's that awesome Quicksilver scene yeah. where he runs... Probably in. the best scene in the movie. Yeah, well, they do that again. They, uh, they, they do another okay. scene where he... It's really good. I mean, you know, the, uh, the guy who plays um, 
He's the guy from American Horror Story. Um, he's super, super great. He's probably the best part of this movie. Yeah, he's, he's witty and he's like, well, he's like Quicksilver, right? So yeah, he's yeah. much better than the Quicksilver in Age of Ultron. I'm glad they killed him. Spoiler oh, alert. Ouch. Yeah. yeah. Because this Quicksilver would not have gotten shot in uh, Age of Ultron, nevertheless. Uh, so yeah, X Men X Mansion gets blown up, and in the aftermath of that. Um, uh, Mystique and Hank and Quicksilver get taken by Stryker, who's the guy in charge of Weapon X. And they take them to the compound. Uh, young Jean Grey, Nightcrawler, and Cyclops follow them and break them out with the help of Wolverine. And then when they leave the compound, Stryker never shows up again. And he has nothing to do with the movie after that. And <laughs> nothing has changed. Doesn't show up at the end. Of the, the, the only thing that happens is that you get a stinger at the very end of the movie. I guess spoiler, it, whatever. Mm -hmm. they, they they tease Mr. Sinister, who is uh, Essex, I believe. Essex Corp. Yeah. I had to look it up because I didn't know mm -hmm. what it meant. Like I I was expecting to see like, you know, X twenty three's body in like a tube or something. Right. I was like X twenty three, X twenty three. A, a, a little bit, a little bit too early in the timeline for X twenty three, though. I mean, fine, but like, it was kind of like, huh? and then it was like, <laughs> yeah, it was like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. They don't have the art of the stinger down like Marvel no, does, they right? Do, they do not. Well, they <laughs> there's that hilarious stinger at the X at the end of X Men three, mm -hmm. where um, there's like this weird like CG Patrick Stewart, and he's like Mara, and she's like. <gasps> Xavier, you're alive. Oh, that's the end where he's like in the hospital. Yeah. He's like shows up in some other dude's body. Yeah, and, like, and yeah. it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. I mean that that movie's rife with problems. So. <laughs> well, they they make a jab at that in in this film. They like, do. They essentially say, you know, they they go to see Return well, of the Jedi. They see Return of the Jedi. This and they movie's set in 1983, so it's in theaters. Um, and Nightcrawler has never been to America, so he's never been to a mall, I guess. So they take him to a movie, which is really weird to me because Nightcrawler is definitely a mutant and he's blue. Oh. How did they, how did they take him there without people being weirded out? It's kind of weird. Yeah, right? you don't really think about it. Huh. Yeah. Well, he's just a really did they put him in like a trench coat and a hat or something? But he walks out of the theater just in like his MJ like red like jacket. Yeah. Yep. I, yeah, okay. That's something to think about. Kind of weird, right? But that that that's something... That makes sense though. Like as far as the storytelling point, I it it would be more uh, jarring to have him constantly switching in and out of disguise than just displaying the character as I, it is. I agree, and to be fair, this isn't something I've really thought about until I literally brought it up now. Yeah. Um it's Whatever, it doesn't break the movie or anything. No, but and, and it's a fun moment too. I want I want an entire movie about Young Jean Grey, who is Sophie Turner, uh, plays Sansa Stark. Um, the the dude who plays Cyclops is great. Um, they I think they finally kind of nailed um, like the character. Uh, not James Marsden and his stupid oh, fucking face. Yeah. Um, and uh, the kid who plays Nightcrawler is really good. Actually, him and the dude who played Nightcrawler in X2 pretty much they look like the same person yeah, just well, it's a, a miniaturized version yeah. and they're both great they're both equally great mm -hmm. i don't know why they didn't bring nightcrawler back for x3 but yeah mm -hmm. that was definitely a thing where um one thing that i was kind of like interested to see apocalypse is um something that i really didn't like in the old x-men is jean gray uh uh, yeah. I just don't like the actors. I don't like how they handle her. Yeah. Um, but she's a character who I know in the comic books, it's like, she seems like a character I would like. Yes. So I feel like it would be nice to see somebody else play her. She's really and good. And Sophie Turner, I mean, I mean is, yeah. I mean, I like her in general. Um, so just being able to see that whole dynamic, I think is nice. Uh, well, but, her and Scott, like it's kind of an origin story for the two of them. Yeah. Like this is the first time you see them in this universe, like this timeline, I guess. Although also kind of weird from the point of view of, isn't, I mean, I guess Wolverine is the same age. Oh yeah, it's, it's really weird. But it's like, eh. you, you don't think about it when Jean is like, you know, middle-aged in the original movies, yeah. but they're like the... It's definitely like, here's like a 15 year old that you're gonna the, try and vote. The <laughs> end of the Weapon X scene culminates yeah. with um, Jean Grey like taking Wolverine's face in her hands and like 
psychically giving him part of his memories back so that he's not just a feral monster the rest of his life. Um, and during that scene where she's like got his head yeah. in, it, in her hands, I can't help but think, awesome. he wanted to fuck you. And I'm like, ah. Well, but ah. I mean, in the timeline, this would be before. Well, that, right? well yeah, because this is 1983. Yeah. So the events of the original X Men is like 2000. Yet. So that's like 17 years later. So yeah. fine, that's fine. The, whatever. But Wolverine, just, you're still like 100 years old, just man. Just when you <laughs> think about it, like out of. Context. Out of it's context, kind of, it's really I, weird as hell. It's a Twilight situation. He's yeah. like, he's like hundred years old, <laughs> and she's only seventeen. But that's that's been sort of weird canon with with the X Men. Like uh, Xavier has been known to have uh, to harbor feelings about Jean, and when she was a everybody teenager, wants a piece fortunately of Fortunately, not in this movie. Even in uh, the uh, Marvel had like a short. Uh, series, it was like their reboot to try and get new readers in. I think it was yeah. the uh, Unlimited. No, not the Unlimited. Um, it was like sort of like spin off. So they had like all the heroes had like new origins and they were different and interesting. Okay. Imagine that. They gave them whole new origins. Yeah. <laughs> Same, they did it with X Men. Uh, the first sort of volume was called The uh, Tomorrow People. And it's, you know, Gene's a teenager and Wolverine is still Wolverine. And, you know, they imply that, yeah, that they have. Uh, Relations? They have relations. Oh. Gross. Dudes are creepy. Period. Like, yeah. they're all kind of messed up. And being uh, honest about it, right? So. Yeah, no. Uh, it, it is just definitely one of those things that with Jean... I feel like in the scope of the movies, I know that she has, like, her psychic powers and stuff like that, but it kind of takes a backseat to, like, her real superpowers that everybody just fucking loves her. Yeah. And wants a piece of her. <laughs> and like, when it's presented in such a way that she's not an interesting character and she's kind of grating. But one thing I will say is that it definitely uh, sets up the relationship between Scott and Jean. Yeah. Because the new, uh, as I said, the new Scott Summers is pretty fucking great. And um, it's not James Marston. As, as great as Cyclops can be. Yeah. Well, yeah, but uh, I mean, like, he's, he's pretty cool. And. Cool guy. Minor spoiler, but even though you see it at the fucking in the fucking trailer, oh. um, it's where Mystique is like, "You're not students anymore. You're X Men." <laughs> but there's this cool reveal of the uh, of the original team yeah. in their outfits, like okay. look straight out of the comics. Yeah, yeah. Like Cyclops has the cool like cross belt with the X on it, well, and is it's it like blue the, and yellow. The 80s they, stuff? Yeah, they kept the yeah, color okay. from like the animated series. And, and the comics. Storm is great. Like she's she's really great in the movie. Oh, okay. um, I the one big issue I have with this film is that they have such few actual dialogue. Like Storm has like she has maybe like, like a line. Yeah. Well, she has a little bit more. Well, like she's there in the beginning, and then she says nothing throughout the. Or entire rather, video. Psylocke has. Well, like, then they also say that uh, Jubilee. Well, Jubilee, Jubilee, Jubilee doesn't have a Jubilee big Jubilee is either. not in it. Well, oh, well, she's she's in it. Oh. But she's yeah. there for like. She's like. She's she's got like, and she's really cute too. And I'm like, bring her back, man. Yeah. Come on. She's like Jubilee. twelve. Okay. Come on now, Alex. I'm not <laughs> pulling a Wolverine. Out. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Fuck you guys. No, like, she's adorable. Yeah. And and, yeah. She, and I can't wait to see her in the next movie. Uh, because I think they're doing a time jump again to the 90s. But then doesn't... So, so yeah. are they going to recast people then? No. Or right. like they're just going to... They're, they're, they're going to wait 10 years before the well, next X-Men well, movie Because it, it was weird because, um, you know, you've got Nicholas Holt and Jennifer Lawrence. Yeah. Jennifer Lawrence doesn't matter because she's Mystique. Mystique yeah, is yeah. technically ageless at that point mm -hmm. in terms of appearance. Yeah. But you have like um, McAvoy and Fassbender and Holt from the Sorry. 60s. I thought I heard Macklemore first. Macklemore, yeah. <laughs> Who's ageless. Who's ageless, yeah. <laughs> no, you've got, you've got those three from uh, X-Men First Class which takes place in the, the Cuban Cold Missile War, Crisis yeah. in mm -hmm. the 60s and then they go into the 70s mm -hmm. uh, with Days of Future Past. Mm -hmm. And now it's ten years later in the '80s, and they all look the fucking same. Like Nicholas Holt does not look like he's any older. Well, because he's he's our age, isn't he? He's like twenty. Uh, he's something like that. Um, yeah. He does not look like he aged twenty years in you know the, yeah. the span between those two movies. Secretly, they all have healing factors. We just don't know about. I it. guess it's part of being an X Men. Um, but anyway, we'll we'll wrap this up. Uh, this is a strange, general, meandering, interrupted conversation. Yes. Uh, general <laughs> general review of uh, X Men Apocalypse is it's perfectly fine, and 
if it you're, is a serviceable X Men. Yeah, like <laughs> if if you like the X Men series already, then definitely go see it. Um, if you're not super sold on X Men, this probably won't change your mind. Um, all I can say really is that it gave me hope for the next one. So cool. <laughs> I'll, give, I'll give a it a new hope. I'll give it a oh. pass. I'll, I'll give it a I'll give it a good pass. Like three out of four. Three By that he means he is giving it a passing grade. Not passing grade. Passing not, not and like, watching it. Yeah, no. Yes. <laughs> that was a good movie. It's give a solid. It it's a solid B. <laughs> like, it was enjoyable. B yeah. effort. It's fine. Yeah. Thank you for returning to another episode of Starchives. As usual, you can find me at Lord underscore Lexon on Instagram and Twitter. And I'm. You can find me at Illustratorium. And Jen. Uh, princess underscore gem four on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for coming by, and we'll see you next time. Bye bye. Kung Fu Pac Man.